you may wonder um, who can have a liver transplant. Patients can be considered for a liver transplant if you have end-stage liver disease, new onset fulminant liver failure, liver cancer, no evidence of active substance abuse, cancer that has spread, uncontrolled infection, and non-compliance with medical therapies. Any of these variables would be difficult to get a patient through a liver transplant because it wouldn't benefit you. Active substance abuse would damage your new liver. Cancer that has spread would spread to other organs. You would be offered other treatment. Uncontrolled infection is not someone with an occasional respiratory infection or bladder infection, but someone that continues to have infection. And knowing the type of medications that you would take after a liver transplant, which suppress your immune system, in other words, makes it more difficult for you to be able to recognize infection, like a fever or chills or warmth to the touch in the area that's infected. Those are kinds of symptoms that would be masked by these immunosuppressive drugs that you take for the rest of your life. Non-compliance with medical therapy is probably self-explanatory, but we worry about patients that miss appointments, that do not get blood testing done, that maintains them on the waiting list for liver transplant, and those are kind of things that make it difficult to get us to a successful transplant for you. I want to go back to the fulminant liver failure. Fulminant is another word for acute onset of liver failure, and that does not include anyone in this room. Someone with acute liver failure does not have end-stage liver disease or a chronic liver disease. They are someone that is expected to be very ill for quite some time. They could actually pass away within a week's time. So it's our job to very quickly assess a patient with an acute liver failure. This could happen, for example, with someone that takes an intentional or an unintentional overdose of something like Tylenol, and that can damage someone's liver. However, when we assess someone, we know that they could recover from this. There's a very a, a good percentage of people that can recover their liver function after a fulminant liver failure. They could go on to need a liver transplant, or they could pass away in a very quick period of time. So it's very important that a transplant team assesses a patient such as this very quickly. In the right-hand corner, you see some symbols, which I'll just explain to you in case you're not sure what they mean. On the upper left, you see what looks like marijuana, and that is what it is. We would be happy if uh, patients were not utilizing marijuana. However, with the legalities of marijuana now and the prescription of marijuana for people to use, we're going to discuss that with you individually and decide if that is something that would be suitable for you to continue to use. Cigarette smoking, we absolutely would like everyone to stop. It is dangerous for your lungs. It's dangerous to undergo anesthesia. You certainly could develop a lung cancer by smoking. So even though it's a, it's a difficult thing to do, we very strongly encourage you to stop smoking and we will help you to do that as best we can. Underneath the cigarettes is an inject, injecture and we want uh, the liver transplant candidate should not be using any illicit drugs. That is what that is standing for. Last case scenario next to it is you see a wine bottle and a glass. And this is the scenario of someone, for example, that has a problem with substance abuse such as alcohol. If you are someone that has had a cirrhosis or a liver damage due to alcohol abuse, that is something that you absolutely have to stop and can never use alcohol again. However, many people ask us, I have never had a problem with alcohol. I have fatty liver disease, for example. Why can't I have a glass of wine with dinner every night as I like? And the answer to that is obviously that you have damage to your liver and the alcohol, even one glass at night, would cause further damage. So we absolutely insist that from now on, no one that is being evaluated for liver transplant and afterwards utilize alcohol at all. Deceased donor livers are matched by region. We are included in region one and you see to the right of the map of the United States all of the New England states. You see that Vermont is not included in that. However, we do have many patients from the Vermont area. The reason it's not included is because some of the insurers for that part of the country will refer people to, say, Region 9, which is the New York, New Jersey area. They have different contracts with those states and oftentimes are referred to that 
region for liver transplant evaluation. Patients are listed with the United Network for Organ Sharing, which if you want to think of it as the big organ bank across the United States. There are different regions in the country, and again, we are in Region 1, which includes pretty much all the New England states. You can be listed at another transplant center in another region if your insurer allows. So initially, you're being evaluated at a transplant center and you decide you would like to go to another transplant center. Right now, there are no rules in place as to how many centers you can be listed in. However, it doesn't really make sense to be listed in another center within the same region. In Region 1, we have several different centers, and if you are listed at Mass General, it doesn't make sense to be listed in another center within this region. However, if you have the means to go to another part of the country, it is possible for you to be listed in more than one region, and we would discuss that with you after your liver transplant evaluation has been completed. But we want you to understand that it is something that is done, and it's something that is possible, but it is dependent on your insurer being able to cover that for you and approving for that. There are over 13,000 patients with end-stage liver failure that are currently listed for a liver transplant in the United States. Unfortunately, that number goes up sequentially. Deceased donor livers are matched based on blood type, and if you're not sure of your blood type, you will know what that is at the end of today. There are four blood types, O being the most common, AB being the most uncommon, and then there's A blood type and B blood type. You often hear people referring to the A positive, B negative blood type. In liver transplant, we're only concerned with the letter. So O, the most common, is, is the biggest list on anyone's liver transplant list. It's also a universal donor. So for example, if someone is interested in donating part of their liver to you, which you will hear about in a little while, if you are O blood type, they need to be O blood type as well. AB, the most rare or the most um, least seen blood type, a universal recipient. So if your blood type is AB, you can actually accept a liver from any blood type, O, A, B, or AB. Earlier you heard a little bit about the MELD score and I'll just review that again. It's based on how sick you are. Unfortunately, there are many patients that we see that are very ill. They have problems with fluid overload. They have problems with encephalopathy. They have problems with bleeding from varices. However, their MELD scores are kind of in the middle of the road. Therefore, the score is the driving force of liver transplant allocation, but there are other ways that you can be called in for a liver transplant with a low score. For the most part, the higher the score, the sicker the patient is, and the higher you are on the waiting list. The scores are also assigned by status one, which is referring to that fulminant or acute liver failure patient that I mentioned earlier. Pediatric patients are listed with exception points. Liver cancer patients are listed with exception points. However, that system has been is in the process of changing, and we will explain that to you further. There are also special exceptions given to other liver diseases that if that is your case, we will describe that to you individually. It is based on geography. The waiting time is really more um, seen with kidney transplant patients. However, depending on where you are in the country might mean you could get called for a liver transplant sooner. I'm referring to the different regions of the country where unfortunately it's not all on an even playing field at this period of time, but if you were to go to say region three, which is in the Florida area, you may get transplanted with the exact same MELD score that you have here in the Massachusetts area sooner. These are organ donor risk factors which we describe to you just a little bit earlier when we talked about the increased risk donor. Organ donors are screened for diseases, viruses, and cancers, as we mentioned earlier, just as you are during your liver transplant evaluation. It is not 100% accurate, and the reason for that is that a donor may, may be in a window period for an infection. For example, three weeks before someone passes away, they could have been exposed to a virus or a cancer. We would not know that. However, as I mentioned earlier, there is very, very little chance that infection or a virus could get transmitted to you, but the risk is not zero. Again, we are more worried about you getting sicker and not being able to be offered a liver transplant. 
Public health service increased risk, as I mentioned earlier, can include the IV drug overdose donor, as I mentioned earlier. It can include someone that has been incarcerated for a certain period of time in jail, knowing that there are increased risk behaviors in jail. We know that people often uh, have many tattoos that we see, and if they're done unprofessionally, that could also cause an increased risk. So these are things that we would describe to you when an organ offer came in, and if the donor had any increased risk at the time of your organ offer.